Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today this is, uh, I guess it's part th three of Mormonism. We're talking about cults. No, I'm sorry, this is part th two of Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> I've done so many of these hangouts, I'm getting confused over them all, I guess. We're talking about uh, religions that many people think are a, a type of Christianity, but or really are not, and therefore we classify them as a cult. Uh, and so we're talking about Jehovah Witnesses. If you didn't see part one, it's available on my channel, Sin City Preacher. This will be part two, and we're going to pick up where we left off. We'll, we'll look at a doctrine from the Jehovah Witnesses and then look at the scriptures to see if, if the Jehovah Witness doctrine is biblical or not. Okay? But first, let's uh, have the panelists introduce themselves. And I guess we'll start with uh, Jackson. Jackson, you want to say hi to everybody? Hello, everyone. My name is Jackson. I am a college student at Colorado State University, and I have Asperger's syndrome, and I consider myself an analyzer. I love analyzing passages of the Bible, theological studies I see, etc., etc. And my YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. Mecca wing zero. It's the word yeah. zero, not the no, not the letters or the number zero. Yeah, uh, I I want everybody to subscribe to Jackson's channel. Start watching his videos. He just recently has been producing his own videos, and what a great start he's gotten off to. They're just you, fantastic videos he's made. So I really recommend you watch them. And uh, next we got brother Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 I uh, don't have any videos yet, but I'm going to be working on that soon. Um, feel free to drop me a line anytime based on anything you might hear. I have no problem answering questions. Uh, hope to uh, have another great study tonight. Yes. I, I encourage everybody also to uh, subscribe to Eric's channel and, and take him up on his offer to ask him questions. Uh, uh, I found him to be... Uh, very, very knowledgeable, and I'm sure he can be helpful if you have questions about the Bible. Uh, and, and next we have Brother Jason, who I just met recently. We've had a couple of private talks on Skype. So, uh, Jason, you introduce yourself to the world right now. Yeah, praise the Lord. I, my YouTube channel is Jason Werner, W E R N E R. I think it's also found through J Werner79. I'm a, a family man and. Uh, a ministry whereby some people and I will go out and we'll just just like what you know Brother Luke does street evangelism and um, we're big into healing not many churches agree with <laughs> with healing the way we do but well we can prove it through signs and wonders and um, we have a lot of fun too with working with our friends who live in the streets and we work with prisoners in, in Ohio. Okay, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and when we visit prisons, it's just well, Ohio. We're, we've branched out to local states too, but I write letters to you know anybody throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't give you other guys applause, but I didn't have my special effects uh, up and running at that point. Uh, okay, well, welcome, welcome, Brother Jason, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know if I've ever told anybody this before, but uh, uh, I've never had any prison or jail ministry, but the, with the homeless, I, I, I used to have a, what's called a sober house, where I, I had a bunch of men who were from the streets. I'm trying to get them sober and uh, teach them the Bible and change their lives around. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And it, it just it just cost me a lot in a lot of ways. So anybody who could work with the homeless or prisoners or something, it's a, it's a very special kind of person it takes for that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's. I'm going to read from the uh, Jehovah Witnesses doctrines, and then we'll discuss what the the Bible says. Um, we talked about the cross. We don't need. I think we finished that up. Uh, the, the Jehovah Witnesses say Jesus was uh, nailed to a pole or a stake rather than the cross as we know it. So now let's move on to this next one. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses uh, announced the date of Christ's return as 1914. 
During that year, Christ came into his heavenly kingdom and fulfilled the promises in the Bible of his return. Really? They think they still hold to that, or that they, or they did hold to that? Uh, well, I'm not sure uh, how current the, this is. I mean, I, I, I did this research uh, probably about uh, six or seven years ago. Okay. So I, uh, I'm not that sure. makes some partial preterists, if that's the case. Yeah, definitely, it does. Uh, I, you know, uh, when I did this study with um, Jehovah Witnesses uh, originally a few years back, I didn't even know what preterism was, <laughs> so so I didn't I didn't know to even classify him as that. So since then, of course, I have learned all about preterism, and uh, this kind of as I read this, I was kind of surprised to read it because I had forgotten this. Uh, but you know, Jehovah Witnesses are famous for uh, making prophecies and them not being fulfilled. So. Uh, let's look at some, first of all, I'd like everybody just to very briefly say your reaction so far to, to, to learn this about the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, whoever talks first, just go ahead and start talking. One of the things I know that, um, that I had studied about Jehovah's Witnesses, actually, they've actually changed dates several times because they've made several predictions that they had that came and went and they were forced to uh, Change. The, the interesting thing I noticed about that is the conflict there because you mentioned them, you, you say they seem to be like a partial preterist, but that's a, that's a real big conflict because one minute they're saying he came into his kingdom and the next minute they're saying they still expect end times things. So I, I really don't understand how they, how they get that conflict resolved. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. It doesn't make sense to me off the hand, so maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Uh, but they are... Uh, Okay, Jason, uh, you got your mic on, Jason. So why don't you take, right. take your turn and talk about what well, you got the mic on? Go ahead. I really don't know what to say about that specific point with regard to Jesus coming back in the flesh. I guess it was in 1914. Um, it's it's a disaster, but we'll get to other issues. I will have some more comments on those. Yeah. Well. I don't think I have a real thorough list of all their prophecies. Uh, a person could simply Google unfulfilled prophecies from Jehovah Witnesses and you'll find, as, as Brother Eric cited, there are uh, numerous times they predicted the end and Jesus coming on a certain date and then it didn't work and, and they're all embarrassed over it. They, they don't recognize that, they deny it, but uh, it can easily be documented. So obviously that proves what? If they've been making these prophecies about Jesus' return, and yet he he didn't come as they said. What does that say about them? Well, they're not prophets. Uh, their prophecies are no good in the eyes of God because God tells us what this measure of a prophet is. A prophet is right 100% of the time about 100% of his prophecies. Otherwise, it's not from God. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and they're, they're, that's not just a... Um, uh, what would you call it, a one man's opinion, that, that is in Scripture. There is actually a verse in the Scripture that says, if a pro prophet fails even one time, then he's not uh, a prophet of God. So that in, in the Bible, a prophet has to be 100% accurate. Um, all right, so let, let's go to Matthew 24, verse 36. And uh, Eric, why don't you take Matthew 24, verse 36 and 42. And Jason, if you if you can, you have a scriptures there with you. I look up Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13. Uh, what was the one you had for me, Luke? I'm sorry. 20 was it chapter 24? 24, verse 36 and 42. That's what I thought. Okay. And Jason, you look up Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13. <clears throat> and Jackson. Uh huh. I've got one for you. Acts 5, verse 3 and 4. All right, Acts 5, 3, and 4. Okay. All right, whoever find, gets it first, let me know, except Jackson, I'm wait, I want to go, you to go last because you're in a different topic. Okay. Here. Okay, so I got, I got Matthew uh, uh, 24, verses 36 and 42. Um, verse 36 states, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And you move down to verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so Jesus is speaking there, and he's saying, Only the Father knows these dates. And he's even, did it say even that the Son of Man doesn't know? 
in, there, in that verse there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jesus is saying that even he didn't know. Some people like to argue that that shows Jesus is not omniscient, or he's, he's not God or something, but that simply just shows that he set aside some of his, uh, some of his uh, power as God temporarily. Um, okay, who, who else wants to talk about that verse? Jason? Okay, uh, Jackson? Um, well, for me, it's a very, um, it's a very strong argument against any group, not just the Jehovah's Witness, who claims that they know when Christ's return is. Like, there was the Herald Camping hoax, if you remember, a year or two ago, maybe two or three years now. And there have been plenty of others. And any time somebody says that, I just kind of shut them off, if you know what I mean. I just kind of think, especially when they're saying it's definite. I don't even like saying, I think it's quite possible it's at this date. I don't even like that. But when they say, like, Harold Camping, I remember said, either it's this date or I'm a false prophet, is what he said. And it wasn't that date. So let's hold him to his own standard. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's cer proof certain that he is a false prophet. Uh, but this has been going on a long time. Uh, uh, With I, lots of different groups. Yeah. Now I remember this, the Seventh Day Adventists, which Jehovah Witnesses really originally came out of Joe Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, and uh, the Seventh Day Adventists first started picking dates and they were wrong. And then the Jehovah Witnesses started picking dates and they were wrong. And uh, they just don't heed the warning of the scriptures telling us clearly don't try to pick a date because no one can know it. And uh, now we don't know the exact date, but what do we know? Well, we can know. Jesus tells us to recognize the signs of the times, that we should be aware and be watchful of the signs of the times to know that the times are coming. Um, it's we're, we're like even even now. I am one of those people. I I don't know how close we actually are, of course, but uh, you sort of, you see the world trending towards certain things, um, and so you can see that we are definitely living in some very unique times. And I believe towards the end of the age. So an interesting thing there too, when they start talking about dates, is a unique thing will happen because during the tribulation they will have. Um, a period of time where uh, certain things are happening where people may be able to know close to when that time is going to be because certain events will be happening that they'll be able to know if they have access to scripture, if they have access to certain things. At this point in the age, we can't possibly know. We know the rapture is an imminent thing. We don't know when it's going to happen, and that's what Camping was trying to do. He was trying to say the beginning of the day of the Lord, you know, as far as the rapture is concerned, he was, he was trying to say he knew the day that was going to happen. We have absolutely no idea what day that's going to happen. But when it comes to certain times in the tribulation as that's happening, there may be an idea time-wise, you know, how much time you're dealing with, um, if you have knowledge of scripture, but um, but like I said, I mean, as, as of right now, there there is no way to know that time, and anybody who tries to set dates is is always shown. Uh, and again, it's the same measure you used. You know, you measure a prophet by how many times you know, are they right, or are they wrong? If they make these prophecies, they're clearly not prophecies from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, Jackson, do you do you know where it says uh, that uh, what we can know? If we can't know the date, what can we know? When, when uh, Eric is talking about the signs of the times. Um, you're asking me where in the Bible does it say uh, that? Or you can paraphrase it if you don't know it exactly. Well, I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't know where it says specific things, but I know that in Revelate, like like it talks about a lot of events happening in the world and stuff during this time and everything like this. I think somewhere there's it's something about Russia attacking Israel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't think that's maybe not the answer you're looking for. But well, well no, yeah, because Jackson, you're referring to the I think we're talking about the uh, Battle of Gog and Magog, which which is supposed to say Russia leads an invasion uh, on Israel towards the last days, and God actually saves them. But even that, they don't know the dates. There's no way of knowing the date for that either. That's all sort of like playing into the times with that. Um, I'm trying to remember the uh, I, I know what Luke was, is referring to and I can't remember how quite well, let me to put give it. You a, let me give you a hint and then you can use this as a key word to search if you got your uh, your uh, Bible hardware up. Sure. The word the key word is birth pains. Yes. That was the term I was thinking of. Um, 
let's find that and read that, and then that, that tells you what we can know. Yeah, it basically explains. I'll look up. I'll try to find the verse. I don't know if it. Some some translations I think use birth pang. Some use it will be like a woman in labor, travailing in labor. Um, it, it'll it'll build and build. Things yeah. will be happening. It'll be much like labor pains. They they will. Um, be happening more frequently. They'll be more intense as they get towards the end, and you'll see this and you'll recognize it. Right. When um, um, I can't, I, I can't find the exact. I'm looking, but I can't find that exact verse. Where if we find it, then we can read it exactly. But I think I can paraphrase it pretty accurately. Jesus says, "You cannot know the day or the hour, but you will recognize the signs of the times." It would be like a woman. Someone. Uh, oh, uh, Jason, you got to mute your mute your mic. Uh, for some reason, your setup requires you to mute your mic when you're not talking. Uh, the same thing with Brother Ronnie. Uh, I don't know why it is, but uh, when your mic is on, if someone else talks, we get all kinds of feedback. Yeah, it may be it may be that your speakers are too loud, or you might want to put like a headset in, like I do. It can it can take yeah. away the feedback. You can hear, so that way you can hear, but it won't come up on your speakers. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so Jesus says you can't know the day or the hour, but you can recognize the signs of the times. It will be like a woman getting ready for childbirth. Uh, as the birth pains come, and if they get closer together, and the, as the pain grows more intense, you'll know that it's about to happen. Uh, so, uh, and he also talked about all the different things that we will see in the world, the, the, the wars and mm -hmm. the and the uh, all the different events that we basically we're seeing happening today. Mm -hmm. So um, I think all of us hold to a, a none of us are preterists that I know of. Uh, I don't know how Jason sees all that, but uh, we believe that there's a rapture and then a tribulation and then so all these things are yet to come. And there looks like uh, who was it that said Daniel? Was it Nebuchadnezzar or someone else? No, it was a different king, but he said there was handwriting on the wall, and, and Daniel had to read the handwriting on the wall. And I can see the world right now, the handwriting's on the wall. It's pretty clear to see that these all these events that Jesus was saying would happen, we see them happening today. So, But we can't know the exact day or hour. Oh, I think I found it. You know, it's funny, Luke, you, you directed me. Uh, to Matthew 24, it's right in Matthew 24. I, if I, I you know, I'm sitting there thinking, why, why do I think we're close to it there? Um, okay. It says, um, it says, it will start with uh, for verse five. We'll start verse five because it covers up to like verse ten. It covers the whole the whole spectrum of what you're talking about here. Starting at verse five, it says, "For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many." Oh boy, is that ever true today. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, it's talking about the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of... Uh, where it mentions, where was the verse? It was 24. Oh, that fast, I lost it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. That's all right. I think we made the point that uh, if someone tries to pick a date, that's really, the Bible says don't to pick a date. And every time they have picked a, picked a date, it's been wrong. And don't listen to them if they pick yeah. up on dates. And so, I mean, this is this is a clear-cut reason that a person should reject the Watchtower and Track Society, the, the, the JWs, because uh, they have numerous times predicted a date and been wrong. So that's all we should know. All we need to know about them that there it is a false prophet. Okay. So the next, uh, I still have Acts 5, 3, and 4 for when you're ready for that. Uh, yeah, the, this is a different question. Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God's act. This is another position of the JWs. 
The Holy Spirit is God's active force. It is not a person and has no voice or personality of its own and is not part of any trinity. Okay, so let's... Uh, Jackson has Acts 5. Uh, Eric, you go with Matthew 28, 19. And Jason, you take 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Okay? Okay, Jackson, the Matthew... Oh, sure, go ahead, Jackson. Huh? Jackson, you, you had... You oh, had to ready Acts. ten minutes ago. <laughs> okay, yeah, for Acts five, three, and four. Okay, here's what it reads. But Peter said, Ananias, and Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it, sorry, whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay. So therefore, we, uh, we deduce what from, from those two verses? What's the conclusion about the Holy Spirit? It seems very much like a person. Hmm? It seems very much that it's um, a person because it says it is conceived in, in, in thine heart. Okay. Uh, it, it certainly uh, it clearly states that the Holy Spirit is God. Right. In other words, it's but when you say lie to the Holy Ghost and that it's conceived this thing, meaning the lie in its heart, it seems very hard to say that that's something that besides a, a person. How do you lie to a, to a force? All right, right on, absolutely. Yes. That just pretty much <laughs> covers it all right there. Is Luke frozen? Uh, I think he might be frozen. Yeah. He's going to have to clone himself and come back. He's got me before, too. It's really strange. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, this happens and Luke will clone himself and come back. He's going to say that. If there's, like, there's a picture down there. <laughs> so we'll either... either, either, either. This is my Either first time. <laughs> this is my first time in this thing. I don't even know. Is this common or what? Uh, what? Not always. It doesn't happen all the time. What's, every, every on, what's, uncom what's uncommon right now is the fact that he's not like back in a second. It usually only takes him like a few seconds and then close. Yeah. I got we knocked off too. I didn't know what was going on. I can't yeah. restart the whole thing. Of everything. There he is. He's back. You're back uh, live again. Cool. I don't know how much I missed, but uh, usually when I get cut out like that in about 30 seconds or a minute, it brings me back. So I'm uh, thankful it did. Yeah. Uh, well, that time we went off the air temporarily. So. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. So nobody was talking uh, at that time. Let me just say what I was the point I was trying to make from that verse, uh, Jackson. Um, the first part of the verse says they lied to the Holy Ghost, and then the second part said they lied to God. So through deductive log logic, we, we, we conclude that this Holy Ghost is God. Okay? Um, so now, um, and let's look at the next verse. The next one was Matthew 28, 19. Right. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 states, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
Okay, so what do we, what can we conclude from that pertaining to this question about who the Holy Ghost is? Well, it distinctly separates all three of the persons of God, the, the, the different personalities of it. Okay, uh, it, I, I get two, two things out of it. One is that, okay, you got that, Jason? Okay. One is the the, the distinct the, the distinctiveness of the three. Each one is distinct, mm -hmm. and and the other is the equality of the three, because it doesn't place anyone in a in a, any kind of a hierarchy. It, it says baptize them in all three of these names. Okay. Um, Jason, do you have Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen ready? Yeah, this is pretty powerful. Good job finding this one. Right, it's like hidden right at the end of the chapter. It's right at the end of the uh, book. So, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Okay. <laughs> okay, could you read it again one more time? I want to see exactly the content again of, of uh, the, uh, who's mentioned. Oops, got to bring it back up here. Second Corinthians. He's just finishing out this letter to the people in Corinth. And it says, this is the King James Version, the authorized version. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Okay, so we've got Jesus Christ, we've got God, which is, uh, we normally, th when it says God, it's referring to the Father, and then you, you've got the Holy Ghost. So, in, again, you have all three mentioned in the same breath there. Well, it's interesting here, too. It's like the communion with a spirit force. That's, yeah. just, so much ridic that's, just, that's just so ridiculous when you, when you run into this kind of stuff, you know? That's how you, that's how you connect what the, the their their position is with what the scripture says, uh, and they're arguing that this is an impersonal force, and then the scripture says you're having communion with with it. So, uh, good good point, uh, Jason. Uh, now let's look at um, Jason. You look up Hebrews nine fourteen. Eric, you look up Luke one thirty five, and uh, Jackson, you look up First Corinthians. 2, verse 10 and 11. So Luke chapter 1, verse 35 states, yeah. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Okay. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people have such a problem with the idea of the Trinity, the idea that God is one and yet three at the same time. It's a concept for some reason, not just Jehovah's Witnesses. We talked about the, the Mormons. They, they had to have a separation there. And that was one of the things Jackson I was talking about. It's, it's kind of a semi-similarity there. They refuse to acknowledge them as the same. They want to say that they're completely separate either a force or or person or, or that they're some kind of entity. They want to separate that. The way I put it to people is the way I simplify it is like I'm a kind of a tech guy, you know. So it's kind of like the idea of having a wireless internet connection. It, God is all these pieces of this. He's all these uh, capacities. Okay, L Christ being the actual physical link to the physical created world. God being the Father, the Spirit, or basically like this. Eternal the server, you know the main the main hub that you're trying to get to, you know, and the Holy Spirit being that wireless, unseen access in a person that we have between the three that links us to all this information. So if you could think of it that way, it kind of and they're separate, but all part of the same. They're just God in a different capacity. That's all they are. They're persons, but just God in a different capacity. Right. This magnet came right off my fridge, by the way. This kind of illustrates, I think, the point that he's trying to make, Eric is trying to make. So, um, now I know that Eric, 
uh, and Jackson and I hold, hold to this Trinitarian um, uh, idea of God, concept of God. And uh, Jason, you do too. You're also Trinitarian. Yes. Okay. Got the thumbs up. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I've, ta I've talked about this quite a bit in the past, too, is that uh, there's another group called modalists that uh, they believe Jesus is God Almighty just as much as we do, and they just think that Jesus changes forms and to be the Father and to be the Holy Ghost. He operates in these different modes, and we think that they, they, all three of these persons are distinct and they are existing simultaneously, distinct but not separate gods, but distinct personages, a part of this god. So again, we've, we've tried in the past, every way we can, to explain it, but the point we want to make clear now is that the Holy Spirit is God, and it is a person, it is not just a force. Uh, now, what's the next verse? Uh, we did Eric's, I think. Who's next? Um, I have 1 Corinthians okay. 10 and 11. Okay which says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, ye, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Okay. Uh, so we, we think of God as being... Uh, omnipotent, all-powerful, and omniscient, having all knowledge, and omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere. So in this case, what, which of those three uh, qualities would that verse demonstrate? Um, would it be omniscience? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's talking about the yeah. knowledge of God. And right. He knows our, our thoughts. And man, we're limited in what we know, but God knows everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are attributes of God. So we're showing that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, and, and now, what was the verse you had, Jason? Was it Hebrews 9.14? Yeah, Hebrews 9.14, which says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God question mark okay we want to focus in on the part of this referring to this spirit and what's the adjective and it goes with this spirit there. Eternal spirit. It's eternal, right, yeah. Eternal spirit. So we see that the Holy Spirit is eternal. Now, eternal is different than being immortal. Immortal means you never die. Eternal means you have no beginning and no ending. Okay? So we can see that the Holy Spirit is eternal, and that... And only God can claim this this, um, this the, the identity of being eternal. Say that again, Luke. Say that again. Uh, only God can can claim this eternal existence. Go back to your definition of eternal and immortal. 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 This, is, this is powerful. Okay. Bring it again. Bring it again. Okay. In, in, the, all of us, all four of us, are immortal. We, we were given immortality when we put our faith in our Savior, Jesus. So now we are immortal that we are going to live forever. But we had a beginning when we were conceived. So it, that it, eternal means that you not only have no ending, but you have no beginning. And only God can claim this word for himself, eternal. So, in other words, we have eternal life, but we are not eternal. Yes, our eternal life, but... Uh, it's eternal in the respect that it doesn't end. And so that's right. why uh, everlasting would be a better word to use and immortality, immortal. And there are plenty of scriptures where we see the word mortal and immortality. Uh, when, we put, when we believe in Jesus, we, we go from um, mortal to immortal. And, uh, and then we receive life everlasting. So eternal can give people the, maybe the wrong impression, but the, just the, what... 
The only one who can really claim eternal existence is God. Not even matter or energy or time can, can, is eternal. Only God is eternal. Okay, now let's go to uh, 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 Jason. Could you take Psalm 139, verse 7 through 13? And Eric, you take Genesis 1 2. And Jackson, you take uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6 and 11. Psalm 139, verse 7. 7 through 13. Through 13, okay. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take to the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Wow, I like that one. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as a day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And you said of the 13th verse, right? Yes. yes. All right, here we go. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we're talking about these uh, uh, characteristics of God, and uh, this one is describing which characteristic? To me, it's funny. To me, that that's always been one of my favorite Psalms verses. Um, to me, it covers almost all aspects of God. I mean, I mean, his presence, his knowledge, his being. He, no matter where you can possibly go, even into even into yourself, your mind, the, he he is aware of it. He has knowledge of what you think. He has knowledge of what you've done, your past, your present. Um, your future, he has. He, no matter where you think you can hide yourself, it's impossible to hide from him because he is everywhere. So, to me, that kind of speaks to all aspects of God. Yes. But I um, think omnipresence is the one that stands out most to me in that passage. Not that I did. Not that I disagree with Eric. I do think it all covers it pretty much all. But though, if I had to pick one that stands out to me most, it'd be the omnipresence, even in hell. I, uh, I was looking for omnipresence in my answer, but Eric is correct. It, it is even much greater than that. Uh, I remember one guy got angry with me years ago. <laughs> People getting angry has been going on a long time. <laughs> but uh, I, I said that God is in hell, and he took great offense. He didn't understand the concept that, that God is omnipresent. God, and this verse here says God is even in hell. He's everywhere. But what's the potential problem with this this kind of a verse, though? If God is everywhere. Well, it's led me to question the common terminology used by many Christians, including many very godly Christians, that hell is separation from God. To be honest with you. Yeah. Um, or uh, death. Yeah, hell is separation from God, or death is separation of God from God. Yeah, that's a that's a common way of kind of redefining those terms, I think. But the what I was uh, wondering about it was the um, I forgot why I was saying that because your your idea was so foreign to what I was thinking about. <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, in hell. Uh, oh yeah. The problem, the problem with this kind of a verse is a person could take this verse and adapt a, 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 a pantheistic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. 
pantheistic. Who, who has to yes. define what that is? Well, th th that's the belief that God is all things. He's uh, he's he's the trees. He's the water. He's the he's he is ev he is everything. He's the dumpster. Right, right. <laughs> in, in essence, yes. That's what they're. You know, you could very well say the same thing. I so, think people don't uh, see that. How would you how would you clarify the difference between pantheism and uh, omnipresence? Well, being everywhere doesn't mean you are everything. <laughs> yeah, that's the distinction. Right, exactly. right. I mean, because to say to say God is part of everything would mean he would be part of the fallen creation, and clearly he's not. He can't be part of that. He's absolutely sinless. Like, he's perfect. He cannot be part physically part of a sin, sin a sinful creation. Right. Um, and to me, that's quite. It'd be quite absurd for me to. For someone to actually take this verse to teach that, because I'm in my apartment right now, that doesn't mean I'm a part of my apartment. <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, no, that's the same concept when the God tells when God tells us we are not of the world. You know, we are not of the world. No, we're not. We're in the world. We're part. We're here. We're in it. So we are affected by it. Things influence us. Do we always do the right thing as a result? No, because we have a lot of. Um, a lot of things that uh, um, you know tempt us in various ways, and we wind up falling to some of these things sometimes. So, so, but we're still not of the world. We're you know we're of God. So that's another kind of way of looking at it. Okay, uh, let's go to the next verse, unless more needs to be said about that. Uh, who is Genesis one two? I got that one. Uh, verse two says, "And the earth was without." form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay. Um, this was talking about the Spirit of God in, in, in serving what purpose? I would say, I would say the omnipresence. Uh, no, I didn't mean what attribute, I meant what purpose. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Wasn't isn't this this is part of what he was doing at the beginning of creation? Right, right. Yeah, this is this is creation. This is creation, yeah. right? This tells us that the Holy Spirit was the creator. Now we also have other verses that say that Jesus was the creator and that God was the creator, and so so uh, uh, obviously we have to conclude that uh, if God's the creator and Jesus is the creator and the Holy Spirit's the creator, then they're all God. Right. Uh, how about Second Corinthians? Who's got that one? 12, 6, and 11. I've got that. Hold on. Let me just go to my ribbon that I put there. All right, so 12, 6 reads, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he hath seeth which he sorry which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me then verse 11 in first corinthians 12 all says i am become a fool in glorying yet ye have compelled me for i ought to have been commended of you for in nothing am i behind the very chiefest of apostles, very cheapest apostles, though I be nothing. Okay. Uh, well, these verses I had in my notes here that would would address the question of sovereignty. I'm, there's probably better verses to address sovereignty. Uh, but what what? How do we see the word sovereign? If God is sovereign, what does that mean? Sovereign means he has authority and can do what he wants. He doesn't answer to somebody else. Right. Okay. Now, uh, how would a Calvinist define sovereignty, though? <laughs> that he picks and chooses who he would save and that a man cannot choose to be saved. Uh, well, yeah, but per pertaining to what you're, you just said, you said he has authority. But a Calvinist says what about that authority? The, the, because of that authority, he picks and chooses. He he decides who's going to be. Okay, so he exercises authority in every way. There is no right. freedom. So they take sovereignty to mean not only not only does God have the authority and power to do everything, 
but he also chooses to control everything. Every the words I'm speaking right now, even the, the my heart pumping right now, every, God is controlling everything. He's controlling everything. And I sovereignty know, puppets on strings, essentially. Yeah, sovereignty mm -hmm. really means that he has the power, but he doesn't necessarily exercise his sovereign power. He, but he has the authority, as Eric pointed out. The authority is different than than exercising the authority. Right. But right. in other words, we acknowledge that he could choose to make someone do anything anytime he wanted, but that he's a respecter of free will. <clears throat> well, let me ask you something here. How does what we're talking now? apply then to the Apostle Paul when he got saved. What's interesting about the Apostle Paul, I like to point at other people, he was striving and striving and striving, going after us, our God's people. There's a verse, I think it's somewhere in Psalms, that says that your enemies... God will either subdue them or convert them. So it's like Paul, the way he was living his life, he was headed into a, a dead-end road with regard to, hey, you're either going to be converted and become one of us, or, yeah, you're going to be subdued. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, uh, that That's the beginning of the conclusion I want to draw, Okay. The Apostle Paul, of course, he talked about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He told everybody that how to get saved. And yet his case seems to be different to me than, than the rest of us. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, in this case, God exercised his sovereign uh, authority, and he revealed himself to Paul, and he made him a believer. Now, I'm not a Calvinist by any means, but I think in this case, this is this is God exercising that sovereign authority. In this case, He exercised it. <laughs> he made Paul a believer. Right. Uh, but Paul still had the opportunity. Yes. 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 Here, here's the interesting thing about that. God did not hit a hit a switch and go, Paul, you're a believer, and Paul just goes, okay, I'm a believer. He didn't do that. He influenced Paul by his by affecting him with his presence you know he he comes to him he has the damascus road experience is Saul why are you persecuting me uh, who who are you lord it is i jesus whom you persecute it, he didn't he didn't take a switch and force paul to 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 do that he came to paul and paul as a result the way god works with those things even in regards to us he will he will influence us to an end, but it's still ultimately our choice. It was still Paul's choice ultimately to make that decision. And he was so influenced by God that he did make the decision. God knew what it would take to influence him to get that decision. Uh, okay. Uh, Jackson, you, you, you sent me that uh, video, the audio, of the debate between Bob Wilkin and uh, uh, White. Right. Who? White. I, I, said, I said right. Just yeah. Yeah, uh, I, forgot, I forgot White's first name, but uh, James White. James, James White. Yeah, uh, I thought it was a great, great debate. Uh, I think they both did an excellent job. Obviously, I agree with uh, um, Wilkin, and I, I, he did an excellent job of showing all the problems with with uh, White's uh, viewpoint. But I noticed one thing in that. I'm really thankful that you sent me that because it opened my eyes to a new word that I've never used before. Uh, I've always said believe means that you um, it, believe does not mean that you um, surrender, follow, serve, submit. These are not words that are related, synonymous, or likened to believe. The words that are likened or synonymous or interchangeable with believe are trust, uh, depend upon, rely upon, faith, these are all parts of believing, but uh, Wilkin used the word convinced, mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of a, a light went off. I said, wow, that's something I really didn't uh, really even connect to this, but, but when we believed, we, we came to a point where we were convinced, and, that, and when we were convinced, of course, we believed, okay? Now, what did it take to convince you guys? Uh, I don't know. We could all tell our own stories, but at a certain point, I was convinced that Jesus is God and my Savior, and I needed him. And then we can say that I believed. But I couldn't believe unless I was convinced. 
And uh, th then, uh, in this case, I think we could say that Jesus, by appearing to Paul the way he did, he convinced him and made him believe, because you could, he couldn't help but believe. It was so convincing. <laughs> well, that's a pretty unique experience to go through. I would say yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to now another teaching of the uh, Watchtower Society. It says, in his pre-existence, Jesus was the angelic being described in the Bible as Michael, the archangel. He has only the power and nature of a created angelic being. The society has drawn this conclusion and teaches this as a doctrine as a result of their understanding of certain scripture references, uh, Colossians 1, uh, 15 through 17, and John 1, 1, uh, and uh, also see Revelation 3, 14. Okay. Uh, in order to understand the society's position on this issue and in order to be able to see the way in which they have deviated from and even deliberately changed the plain teachings of the scriptures, we examine their translation of two key passages as found in the 1984 edition of the Society's New World Translation. Um, well, that's... Uh, well, first let me, before we go into any scriptures on this, just what's your first impression? If you didn't know it, or you probably were already aware of this, that they believe that Jesus is not God Almighty. In fact, he is Michael, the archangel. Mm. So what's now, what, your immediate response to that? My, my immediate response would be when you have a reference here that they specifically reference there, which is – you said it was Colossians 14 through 17? Uh Co Co Colossians uh, 1, Chapter 15 1, 15 through 17. 15 through 17. So let's go there and see what the Bible says about that, since that's what they're using. Okay. okay. Um, I went there. It says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Where did they get that from that? <laughs> I don't yeah, see it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read. <laughs> you, you read, you read, and then I'll tell you stop, and I'll read. And we're comparing what – what are you reading from? What, sure. Uh, I'm reading from the King James Bible. Okay. You're reading from King James, and I think you could probably get this in other translations too. But this shows you the difference between the New World Translation, which has purposely tried to ch make Jesus into an angel instead of God. Yes. And so they've rewritten it. And so read it, and I'll stop you when you get to Sure. Uh, we're going to start at verse 15 again. Yeah. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Okay. Okay. Of, of every what? The firstborn of every creature. Oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't say the firstborn of all creation? Not King James, no. It says of every creature. Okay. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Um Hmm. What what um verse is that again? It's Colossians chapter one verse fifteen. Colossians one fifteen. Hold on, I'll bring okay. up Bible Hub. All right, no, I got it. I've got it. I'm, I'm looking. I had it wrong. I was I was thinking the King James was the other one, and I had it backwards. So, okay. So, uh, the they say he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And it says, because by means of him all other things were created in the heavens. Now you read the, your part. For by him what? For by him were all things created that are okay. in heaven and by that all, are on earth. It says, for by him were all things created, right? Yes. But they have changed it and said, because by means of him all other things were created. <laughs> Okay, you see how putting in the word other there? A very subtle one-word change is all it takes, and I've noticed that uh -huh. in several translations. Right, I believe they also do this in John 1.1. 1, 1, yeah, we're going to go to that We're going to go to that one next, but we're comparing this one now. Uh, so now uh, you read, um, and then it says, as you go further, it says, um, all... All 
things were created by him and for him, but they say all other things were created through him and for him. All other things. So what's the, what's the uh, effect of inserting the word other in there? It's implying he was a created being just like we were. Everything, he was one of the created things. Yeah. So they, they need to translate it in a way to support their, their viewpoint that he is not God but, but an angel. So they just rewrite the Bible to, to uh, support their doctrine. Uh, you know, but, but here's the thing, and, and no, you're absolutely right. My problem with them with that is that's pretty thin. I mean, that, <laughs> that's pretty thin because the Bible has several places in it where it mentions, mentions Michael specifically. Don't you think it would be kind of important to kind of equate yeah, the like two to, of them together? I, I'd also <laughs> like to know who these brilliant Greek scholars are that can be translated. <laughs> I'd really like to see all of their excellent scholasticism. Well, uh, I don't have the information right in front of me, but I remember when I studied this out originally, uh, there was nobody on their translation committee that had higher than a high school education, and no one understood it Greek. Well, see, there you go. <laughs> there, that's... Okay. Are you, so, uh, uh, yes. are you asking about their group of translators? Yes. Yes. Okay, check this out. Uh, you might be able to find, I have a paper version of this, a lawsuit that was filed by Charles Russell, obviously the founder of the Russellites, now known as Jehovah's Witnesses. He claims to be the person who translated the New World Translation. Obviously, he pulled it from the King James Version. He was uh, mad because he was saying that he was slandered by a person named Charles Ross. I think he was from like New York City or something like that. I haven't heard a case in more than 10 years. So Charles Russell filed a lawsuit against Charles Ross saying, hey, you're telling people that I, this, that, everything else. So they went to court, and he took the actual uh, Greek language and said, here, he's on the stand, Charles Russell is. And he says, here, read Greek. We'll see if what you actually do know about this you know, original language of the New Testament. And of course, the Septuagint was the Old Testament. And he couldn't. So the case was thrown out. But he couldn't prove that he knew any Greek. He claimed to have, and during that case, he claimed to have known Greek, and that's where the case got thrown out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's pretty scandalous when you really look at the history of the founders and, and how it all got started and and all their claims. It's really a, just a, it's so, so much like Joseph Smith and what happened there. Basically, it's con men, <laughs> just a bunch of con men. Uh, yeah. Well, the thing is, I think you, somebody else might have the year it was translated, but that the New World translation is relatively new, and that at one time they just used the King James, and of course they had to kind of dance around and, and mess, mess around with things to get it to teach their doctrine, but I think that they used the KJV before they used the New World translation, too. It's just that it got to the point probably where people were seeing too much through the doctrine and everything. Yeah, and for just this verse right here when it says he created all things, that you could tell a, Jeho a JW, say, look, this says Jesus created all things. He's the creator. So how are they going to explain that? They have to change it to say, no, it says he created all other things. You know? um, now let's look at uh, John uh, 1. Um, uh, it says in the, the KJV, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then uh, uh, in the New World Translation, it says, in the beginning the Word was and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, little g. So, so it, it, it says, one, in the beginning, the Word was, and then, and the Word was with God. And the word was a God. Mm -hmm. So by by just changing it from a capital G, inserting mm -hmm. the letter A in there, mm -hmm. there's been all kinds of uh, um, teaching on this that they have no right to insert the letter A. There is no uh, there's no uh, linguistic uh, way of justifying it. 
Now, it, it, it's funny. Just inserting that one letter changes the entire meaning of the whole thing because adding an A there makes you a polytheist because by you saying a god, you're saying there are other gods. Which is another thing I was going to ask, actually. Do the Jehovah's Witnesses openly admit to being polytheists? Because remember how we said that we talked about the Mormons in mm -hmm. our previous study and how they act like, oh, no, we're not. And the reason why they're not is really, well, all Christians are actually polytheists. And we already went, we already kind of beat that dead horse with of the absurdity about that. But I wonder, do the Jehovah's Witnesses openly say, we don't believe, we're not monotheists? or? No, what they do is they uh, they say that this uh, God with a little g is really means an angel. It's not a God. It's not God Almighty, and it's not a God. In, in there's more than one God. There's only one God, and yet they refer to the angels as like the sons of God, and therefore Jesus is a God, a son of God, and uh, particularly this one called Michael, the archangel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I think again you're beginning that slippery slope down really stretching things this is I mean it, it's not Why just where you've just begun the slippery slope I think you're sliding full speed at this point. <laughs> yeah you know because I mean you're going from saying sons of God which the Bible uh, uh, specifically separates and talks about angels and then it, when, when, when the Bible mentions God little g it's talking about false gods it's not talking about angels it's talking about false gods not not God Almighty. So to then equate that with angels, I mean, it's really a stretch. That's just. Slightly off subject here. I was just con confirming what I was saying a few minutes ago. The name of the person who was sued by Charles Russell was J.J. Ross. This is in 1912 regarding uh, Hamilton County is where it was. See, here was the cloning of himself thing. We were Luke has cloned about. himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, if, if you think I'm good, there should be more than one of me. You know what's kind of weird? You know what's kind of weird? It always freezes when he has his glasses on. I've never seen it. <laughs> he doesn't have his glasses on. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I do see that. See, that's you, Jackson, and that's your attention to detail. It's <laughs> we're still alive, though, which is good. I, you know, yeah. we, and okay. he's with us. He just, it's just there was that dead clone that just died. Yeah. I just, uh, I just ejected it. Yeah. By the way, I do have the power to eject any panelist at any time. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, you're you're yourself. <laughs> there's an ejection seat you're sitting on. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, we've, we're, we're looking really examples how they changed the, uh, wrote a, their own Bible. Now what we're supposed to do is read the Bible to determine our doctrine. What they do is they determine their doctrine from a committee of people and then they write a Bible to support those doctrines. Notice right. again we have the leaning to man's understanding rather than God himself. Uh-huh. And in the you mentioned as far as versions of the Bible that they used. I know for some time back there, it's been a little while now because I said I had some friends who were Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, I know that one of the things they use is the same type of thing that the Mormons use when they come to the house. They say, you know, people would say, "Well, I, I believe in this," and they'd hold up their King James Bible, and people would say, "Oh, we use that too," and that's the same uh -huh. thing with the Mormons that they'll well, say, right. well, "We we do that, we use that too," um, and then what they'll tell you how, but it's wrong. It's not quite. Entirely correct. <laughs> totally. What year did the Jehovah's Witnesses start? Do we know that, or I think it was around 1850, if I remember right. Okay, that, that's remember. quite a long way. That's a that's at least a generation or two before the New World translation came out, and I think they just had a KJV. Now, what what the Mormons have done is they've added footnotes and everything to mm. be like, well, this means this sometimes. Something right. Like the, just completely contradict all the essential Christian doctrines. It seems like the Jehovah's Witnesses just said, we're going to be a little smarter than that, and we're going to come up with our own Bible. That's what it seems like to me. Well, because it, it became too much of a hassle trying to explain this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now there's also um, verses that they didn't necessarily change, but they say that you and I, we just don't understand what those words mean. Oh, well, I see. 
Uh, someone read uh, Revelation 3.14. Revelation, right. you got you got it. Yeah, I got it. It says, "And unto the angel of the church of the lac lac laudations la la laudations or dacians." Okay, right. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Okay, the beginning of creation of God. Yeah, the beginning. Okay. So. Uh, here, here's how they, they see it. They see that the word beginning means that that which comes at the start of something. And but, but we see the beginning as the origin or source and first cause, or that which stands in the prime position. So, how do you see the the, the definitions I've given you here? A Jehovah Witness would say that the beginning, that word beginning means that which comes at the start of something and we would interpret this word beginning in that verse as the origin source and first cause or that which stands in the prime position uh, what do you think of these two uh, and which do you think is correct the, the Jehovah Witnesses uh, definition or interpretation of the word beginning or the the typical uh, biblical interpretation You want to read it again, Eric? Uh, verse. Uh, oh, that was uh, Jackson. Go ahead, Jackson. Oh, Jackson. Yeah. Okay, sure. Let me let me get to it again real quick. It is um. John. Okay. All right. So it was three fourteen, and this is what mm -hmm. it reads. It says, "And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness." the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, the beginning of the creation of God. So you're there saying that this word beginning there means that that which comes at the start of something. So he's like the first of the, of the God started this creation and Jesus is the, is the first thing that he created. Uh, and I would define the, the beginning there as the origin or source and first cause or that which stands in prime position. Now, you want to talk about the distinction between these two ways of seeing the word beginning in that case. I think, again, this is where you have to check Scripture with Scripture. You already read John, where John states, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Um, this is, again, state, and that corresponds with these verses, the beginning of the creation of God. He was, he was literally the beginning. He, he started all creation. Well, can you see how the beginning could be, the way I see it is, the beginning is the origin or source and first cause of this creation. Yes, that that's kind of what I was trying to say. Yeah. So, but he's not the he's not the first. They would say he's the beginning. That he's the first thing. The created. first created. Say right, he's, right. The, he's the beginning in that he's the source of creation. Well, it's right. interesting because I've never, um, I never would have even thought of the Jehovah's Witness doctrine just by reading that. Only after you explained it can I even see how well what they're do what they're thinking. Is based on that, and I think that that should at least cause us to pause for a second, at least a yellow flag, if not a red flag. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's look at the word uh, "firstborn" in Colossians 1:15. So, someone find that. And. Uh, uh, Someone else find Genesis 24:31. I should have mentioned your names. 24. I'll grab that. Uh, yeah, I, I I had the Colossians one before I got that. Um, it's um right. chapter one verse 15 was, "Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature." Okay. Uh, so now we know that a a, a JW is going to say the firstborn of every creature is going to mean that. They say that he's the first thing God created, the first creature. Jesus is a creature, one that is created rather than the creator. 
uh, but uh, the, the the word firstborn in this case and, and all the other cases I'm going to give you really means the uh, the priority pre preeminence or prime position and let's go to Genesis 24:31 to, well, to make that point well, real quick back to the Colossians 1:15 they're completely ignoring the first part of the verse. Who is the image of the invisible God? Uh, aren't aren't they kind of completely ignoring that? There's, I mean, isn't that saying right there? <laughs> he is the image. He is the image of God. <laughs> they said, "Well, we're created in God's image too." Well, we're we're created in the image of God. He this says he is the image of the invisible God. Right. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's look at Genesis twenty-four thirty-one to to see the uh, the correct way to see this word uh, firstborn. Uh, twenty-four thirty-one, and he said, "Come in, thou blessed of the Lord." Wherefore, or those would say Yahweh and Jehovah. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for. The camels? Yeah. For, what? for what? The camels, I don't know. So it says like we're going to have camels over for dinner or something. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Is that what it says, 2431? Yeah. yeah. That's, yep, it says camels. Okay, I must have chosen written down the wrong verse in my notes here. Uh, this is talking about uh, Esau, uh, who was the firstborn. And the firstborn has a birthright in Judaism and much of the world. Whoever is the firstborn male of the family has a particular birthright and prime position in preeminence. And so when, it, when Jesus is referred to as firstborn of creation, he has preeminence over all creation. And uh, uh, let's try First Chronicles... Uh, I think it's Chronicles C H I wrote down five one. Uh, Jackson, could you look up Genesis forty one forty one verse fifty one and fifty two? Sure. Okay, I've got the Chronicles verse if you want okay, that one. <clears throat> the chapter Chronicles first Chronicles chapter five verse one says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Okay, so here you see the relationship between firstborn and birthright. Uh, the firstborn of a family has a birthright that is greater than all the other children, and uh, so and it's 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 called preeminence. So he has a preeminent uh, position and birthright, and that that is the correct way to see Jesus when it calls him firstborn of creation. It means he has this position where he has preeminence over all creation. Uh, did, did you get Genesis forty one? Yeah, Genesis forty one fifty one and fifty two, right? Uh huh. Okay, here's fifty one. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Hmm. Does that, that doesn't say anything about firstborn there, does it? No, I mean, this is Genesis 41, 51, and 52. All right. I apologize. Some of these verses I wrote down, I must have written them down wrong ways. Uh, who has, did someone look up Jeremiah 31, 9? And uh, let me see. Uh, Jackson, you look up Psalm 89, verse 27. Okay. Okay, I got the Jeremiah verse. Okay. 
Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, verse 9. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Okay. Um, so uh, these are examples of, of showing that the term firstborn is not only the first one born, but not, not necessarily. Sometimes the firstborn doesn't get the, the title of firstborn. It's changed. And I think we find this in, the, in this next one. Uh, Psalm, do you got the Psalms, uh, Jackson? Yes, Psalm 89:27 reads, Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Okay, so David was not firstborn in the family. Uh, he was the youngest of the brothers, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so his, uh, he didn't really deserve the title of firstborn, but God designated him as firstborn. And that, did, that doesn't change the chronological order of the birth, does it? No. It, it just changes his position or his, his uh, significance. The significance, or the um, what was the word I used before? The uh, the birthright and the preeminence. He had preeminence. That's the, what when you when you're called firstborn, it's you're given preeminence. Okay. So you see that they take words like uh, begotten and firstborn and try to make Jesus into a creature instead of the creator. A big problem with that, folks, is that. This is a love that God has for us as we are his children. When you become a Christian, you're literally a son of God. And that's what his desire, whereby us sons of God, uh, 8th chapter of Romans talks about this, whereby we are literally manifesting Christ in our bodies. And that's, that's very dangerous when we are just missing the, the point that Jesus Christ was the firstborn after he rose again that third day. Now all sons of God are here to be manifest the same way. Mm -hmm. So they say that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel and he's a created being. Uh, so let's look at, uh, there's a lot of verses. We've, I've done this at great, great length in, in, in other uh, studies. So I, I hate to repeat it too much, but let's, uh, how about uh, Jackson, you take John 20, 28. Okay. Um, Eric, you take Hebrew 1, 6, and 8. And, uh, yeah, let me see. And, uh, Jason, you take Philippians 2, 6. There's a lot more verses that we could, uh, we could go to, but these are three that I think will tell us clearly that Jesus is God, not an angel. Okay, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 8 says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And verse 8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Um, I, I remember doing a, a study on, in one of these uh, hangouts, we went into great depth on the whole chap, first chapter of Hebrews because I believe the first chapter of Hebrews is the best chapter in the whole Bible to tell us who Jesus is and it clearly uh, debunks the whole idea that Jesus is an angel. Uh, in this case it says what that he is worshipped by the angels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we read more of Hebrews it would say that he is uh, what, what angel did God um, if you can find there, look look at the rest of Hebrews right around that verse. And did you read that, Eric? Was that you? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm Hebrews chapter one. Yeah, read the verses around it, and it'll tell about how uh, God says, "What angel did I do this?" This is really this verse is answering and debunking sure. the whole claim of of uh, 
uh, Jehovah Witnesses claiming that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Right, or, or having any kind of equality at, to the level of who Jesus is as a person. The, <clears throat> verse 3, let's start with verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, and first, first of all, here's the first distinction. Yeah. Wrong. Distinction. Down to verse 5 is the big one you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but, but it, it be, it, this whole thing is talk is debunking the idea that he could be an angel. This Absolutely. is the first distinction saying being made so much higher than the angels. Not made in terms of created, but but his stature, his standing is, is so much greater. Not Absolutely. Really created that way. But, but verse 5, it's funny, it's great you went there. I'm glad you went here for this, for this chapter because verse 5 states, here's the debunking verse. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have, have I begotten thee. It says he never said that to them. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. A question mark. He's asking. He never said that. <laughs> yeah. So here, this verse, this is almost like they wrote it specifically uh, to these JWs. Like, like, like God looked ahead into the future and saw that these JWs were going to claim that Jesus is merely an angel, Michael the Archangel. And so they, God put this in the scriptures to tell the Jehovah Witnesses, no. He, and, and that's what the first chapter of Hebrews is all about. Okay, so let's go to the next verse that I gave. I forgot what I said. Who has the next one? I've got um, John oh, okay. 27, real, okay. or sorry, 2028, real clear, simple verse where it says, And Thomas answered and said unto them, My Lord and my God. Okay. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him or say, No, I'm not actually that. Yeah. I mean, uh, we could cite a lot of examples where man fell on his knees and began to worship an angel or mm -hmm. another man. Peter was worshipped, Paul was worshipped, and they all, first thing they say is, don't worship me, I'm just a man like you. I was angels, just thinking the same thing. Angels always did the same thing. Whenever a man did, wanted to worship an angel, an angel said, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger. You know. Uh, but Jesus, he did not correct Thomas and say, wait, don't worship me, I'm just a man or I'm just an angel. He accepted the worship and the title of God. That's right. Okay, so what's the next, next verse? Uh, give one more. Yeah, Philippians 2 6. And who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know, I'm going to keep it going. It's a colon right there, seventh okay. verse. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made. In the likeness of men, he's made in the likeness of men just for that time, you know. Yes. Uh, so there, there's two things that are important there. Uh, uh, the first part it says he does not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus is is saying uh, is saying that Jesus felt that he was equal with God and he was not like robbing any glory and taking anything away from God because he's equal. Okay. Uh, now that's blasphemy if it's not true, right? Right. Uh, and that's why Jews wanted to stone him at that time because they knew everything he was saying he was claiming that he was God but an interesting thing that also relates to the second part after the colon is what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about this prophecy question and no one knows the day or the hour and Jesus said not even the man, son of man knows and this this explains it that he what how did it explain it after the colon would you read that again Jason I'm actually going to read A as well because this just keeps going. This is great stuff. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, colon, eighth verse, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Okay, so this is telling us, uh, answers a lot of questions when, when we say, says, well, why doesn't Jesus know about the day? Only the Father knows the day. Uh, this, this is the answer to that kind of a question. Jesus purposely 
re reduced himself in this way. What were the words that used? Uh, he there was a couple of key words that described exactly how he did this. He took on the role of a servant. In he fashioned like a man. Yeah. yeah. Basically, he's saying what you know, he is here as God, but he made himself of no reputation. He's a servant. Okay. And obviously, he's fashioned. He's, he's living in, 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 in a body of a man. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, uh. We talked about the Holy Spirit uh, being omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent, yeah, but now let's look at uh, G these characteristics applying to Jesus. Uh, Jason, look up Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Eric, look up Colossians two thir uh, two three, and Jackson, look up Matthew eighteen twenty. All right, I've got 1820. Okay. It says, for where two or three are gathered together, in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Okay. So what quality of deity is being described here? He's everywhere. Omnipresence. Yeah. Yeah. Omnipresence. And... Uh, and now what's another one? Read the other verse. You did say uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3? Yes. Um, it may make more sense with 2 first. It's a very short line, and it may not okay. kind of really right. cover everything. Right. Verse 2 says that their hearts may might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so what uh, quality of deity is described in Jesus there? He is all-knowing. All-knowing. He has all knowledge. The treasures yes. of all knowledge. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then what about Matthew 20, 28, 18? 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Okay, so all power. All, power. all powerful. Omnipotence. So omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, these are only qualities of God. Uh, and let's look at one more. Uh, Jackson, uh, look up John, um, well, let's go one, John 1, 1, 2, and 15. I think we probably have all those memorized, don't we? Probably quote those. John 2, 15, you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it says... John 1, 1, John 1, verses 1, 2, and 15. Oh, okay, verses 1, 2, and 15. All right. So John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John okay. 1, 2. Yeah. The okay. same was in the beginning with God. And then 15. 15 is, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spake. Him of whom I spake. Oh, he that I comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay, so these verses are talking about the eternal existence of Jesus. He is eternal. Now, as we said earlier, uh, eternal applies only to God. Eternal doesn't even apply to the universe, to matter, or energy, or time. It only applies to God. Okay, um, there's plenty of other verses here where it shows that Jesus accepted worship. Uh, uh, the, the, the demons worshipped him. A certain blind men worshipped him. Angels worship him in Hebrews. The disciples worshipped him. Uh, the saints in Revelation are worshipping him. Uh, so, um, and eventually everyone worships him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So there's plenty of verses. I won't, we won't go into everyone individually. Uh, and then there's, uh, we talked about how he's, um, 
proven to be not an angel in, in Hebrews, and, and that he accepted worship, whereas angels could not accept worship. So now let's go to this idea that um, uh, this is a totally different um, doctrine now of, of uh, JWs. JWs use 1 Corinthians 5, verses 11 through 13, and 2 John 9 through 11, and 1 Timothy 5, 20, to forbid their followers to speak to anyone who has left their organization on the grounds that they are apostate. Uh, so what does the Bible say about disfellowshipping? So first let's look up these verses. Uh, Jason, can you take 1 Corinthians 5, verses 11 through 13? And Eric, you take 2 John 9 through 11. And Jackson, you take 1 Timothy 5, 20. <clears throat> they, they are interpreting these verses to, to, to support their uh, concept of disfellowshipping. Okay, this is, um, it's important, you guys understand, this is the KJV. It's, it's kind of weird the way this goes, okay? So, let's see, you're 11. But now, I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one. No, not to eat. What's that one? Not, not to eat. Twelve. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without, you know, not uh, believers? Do not ye judge them that are within, last verse, but them that are without God judge. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay. Uh, Eric, you want to read for Second John 9-11? Sure. Um, Second John 9-11 through 11 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'm getting out of that one is that I should not let a JW in my house. <laughs> well, uh, that's exactly what I get from that, absolutely. No. It's saying it's saying transgressors, it's, it starts it off at verse 9, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? I am the way, the truth, the life. He is the only way to the Father. To put your total trust in him, which is what we preach all the time, is to have uh, salvation. Those who do not abide in that do not have God. Yeah. Uh, whosoever believeth in the Son hath life. Whosoever believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on abideth him. Abideth on him. There you go. So uh, now, Jackson, you got First Timothy 5.20. Yes, I've got it right here. It says... Th them that sin rebuke before all that others may so that others also may fear wow offhand that verse really confuses me because I always thought you should go to your bro rebuke your brother in private but maybe this isn't talking about a brother it's uh, talking about an elder is it well we'd have to read those in context to, to really see the meaning of them but, but let's I, what I want to do now is let's look at verses that actually tell us about uh, disfellowship uh, let's go to second John uh, that second John 911 that's one who's left the doctrine of Christ that's what we were just talking about Eric mm -hmm. it's, right it, that was... it, it, yeah if someone if someone it's, it's the same kind of thing that I, I been, I've told everybody on the panel, I, I've told this many times to many people, that uh, I want to have fellowship with people who agree with these core beliefs. That's this doctrine we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, can we at least agree that Jesus is God, faith in Jesus is our Savior, is what we need for salvation, and we can never lose our salvation. So if we, that's our doctrine that we rest in, and then if they are... If they don't hold to that doctrine, then we can't have fellowship. It doesn't mean you cannot 
talk to the people and, and teach them. But you, fellowship is different. Fellowship is among believers. Mm -hmm. And if we determine that someone doesn't hold to these basic doctrinal beliefs here, then they're not believers, and therefore we can't have fellowship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not talking about disfellowshipping people uh, over these other things. Uh, let's look at Matthew 24. Uh, let's go to this first. Uh, um, Jason, you look at Matthew 24, verse 23 uh, through 27. <clears throat> and... Eric, you look up Matthew 24, 5, and then verse 24. Um, and then, uh, Jackson, you look up 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and 2. Matthew 24, 23 through 27. Yeah, okay. okay. And then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, Charles Russell, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber. Believe it not, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so this is talking about people making false claims about uh, that Jesus is, is returned. And uh, uh, who's got Matthew 24, 5, and 24? Um, he actually did Matthew 24, 24. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Matthew 24, 5 just simply says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay. All right. Um, and then how about Second Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2? You got that, Jackson? Yes, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in the mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay. Okay, so in other words, it, we're, they're also being admonished to say, don't say Jesus is here now. He's come. Okay, and then uh, did someone get 2 Timothy? Uh, Eric, you get 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18. I think this will be a doozy if I remember it correctly. All right, 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18. <clears throat> but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Okay, so they're being admonished for saying that their resurrection has happened. Mm -hmm. Now, we know people who are teaching that today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> are telling us that the resurrection happened. And, and by resurrection, do they mean like the rapture? They don't mean the re bodily resurrection of Christ, obviously, just for absolute clarity. Oh, yeah. Well, that, this is not referring to the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This talking is talking about, about the rapture. Yeah. Uh, so here we have verses talking about when people claim that he's over here in the east or he's in, in this particular place, uh, or if they say that that uh, he's already come, uh, or that uh, he's present now, he's here, that these are the people that we're supposed to be shunning. Well, so so maybe preterism is even even worse error than we originally thought. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking from this that uh, it's it's really more, you know, you know how I feel about it anyway, as far as I've talked to you all about how it, to me, it's, it's 
it hurts. It's just to someone to tell me that I don't have anything to look forward to. It's bad news theology. Yeah, that there you don't you don't have a rapture to look forward to or a second coming or any of that. It's it's already happened. But what I'm thinking is, in light of this verse, I mean, we, we, I mean, I even have a video that's been pretty well received on this. But the, beyond all that, this is making me even more concerned about it. For example, like the hyper D's, I think what they do with scripture is kind of childish. But this seems like it's t being taken to a new level in, in terms of what we just read. Yeah, let's read Second uh, Timothy two sixteen through eighteen again. Let's let's meditate on that sure. for a minute. Sure. Uh, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. This is, this is another problem he was dealing with the uh, Thessalonians. The people were telling Thessalonians the same thing, and the Thess Thessalonians had lost their hope. They had lost their hope, and they believed that they were going to be going through the tribulation because they believed the rapture had already occurred. And he had to go to them and say, no, it hasn't happened. Yeah. That's disturbing, yeah. Uh, well, these are... These well, are, these are uh, according to these scriptures, these are grounds for shunning and disfellowship. Uh, if they don't hold to the core doctrines, if they're teaching that Jesus has already come, uh, but uh, uh, sh shunning people because they they Jehovah they left Jehovah Witnesses, uh, <laughs> that's what they shun people for. If you are a JW and you leave, that's their grounds for shunning. Let me just also say something before we leave the topic about the verse that Brother Jason read in in First Corinthians, which where it says not to associate or it says not to eat with someone called your brother who's a fornicator, um, covetousness, or an unclean person, something along those lines. You know, there was a really good article in Grace and Focus about this actually, called the so-called so-called brother of that, and. A lot of the newer translations say so-called brother. The the King James just says anyone called your brother, and the New King James says anyone bearing the name your brother. And basically the point is of this verse is not to question the salvation of people, but it's to say if somebody's willingly acting a certain way, it's best to disfellowship with them, even if they are a true Christian, is what I take that. Yeah, and in that chapter, Paul had said that he was delivering him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved. Right, right. And and the point is, the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, a saved person can act in such a way that it's best not to have anything to do with them, even though they are saved. Right. Yeah. Let me jump in here too. What's very common? I mean, this is many churches will do this. They'll go out there and they will use this chapter, and I don't, I don't care. I mean, the denominations is everywhere. If they don't agree with you. They'll just try to find something and put it on you, make it look like you're this kind of person, that kind of person, whereby they can go ahead and find their grounds to excommunicate you. And this is a way of bondage, a way of controlling people, having dominance over people. And that's what big of these cults. You're going to see that with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the Mormons, as Luke had said earlier. It's all about dominating people. And when it comes to your own spirit, nobody should ever dominate your spirit. The only spirit that it should ever dominate you as the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Uh, Jay Jason brings up a really interesting point because we talk a lot about, you know, uh, kicking them, uh, kicking people out of the church if they say they no longer want to be Jehovah's Witnesses and everything. Um, I've read stories that are far beyond that, and I've actually heard people's witnesses of people who've been through this. They literally will destroy your life. I mean, these people, there are stories of people's lives being completely ruined financially, professionally, they have, because of the ties that they have to other people that they know and deal with, there have been people that have gone to the point where they're basically homeless because their family, no one will have anything to do with them, their finances are actually controlled in some of these instances, and so they don't have access to a thing. They're basically out in the cold, treated completely uh, like, a, like a piece of garbage. Well, yeah, that's, that's true, I, I understand what you're saying. But to be candid, I've seen that in many other even evangelical churches, Baptists, oh, Pentecostals, oh, absolutely. everywhere. There's a spirit behind that. It's 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 witchcraft. It's works, really, though. You know, it's works. Let's look at a few more verses here about this on this subject here. Um, Jason, you 
you look up Romans 14 verses 1 through 4. And Eric, you look up Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Jackson, you look up Matthew uh, 10, verse 17, and then go to Matthew 18 and look up verses 15 through 20. Romans 14, 1 through 4. I'll get closer. Maybe you guys can hear me better. I don't know if you're having problems with that or anything. Him that is, well, this is strong. Good job. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Nice. Good job with this one, Luke. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. God hath received him, people. Wow. For who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own uh, master? He standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Wow, praise God. Also in a um, letter to Galatians that Paul wrote, there's, you know, them that are weak in the faith. With, 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 I think it's a fourth chapter, first verse in Galatians. Mm -hmm. Or no, actually it's 6-1. Yeah, 6-1, that's where Eric's going next. But first let's stop on this I'm one. sorry, I didn't realize that. It, it's, saying, it's saying that we are to accept the weak brother. If, yes. they're, if they're, I mean, they're carnal, and they hit. Look, I, I have a problem with fornication. You know, yeah, this whole yeah. porn thing. I got a problem with that. I need help. Yeah. It's one yeah. thing when you come out and say I'm weak, and another thing when you just keep doing it and calling up a brother it doesn't look good for us. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Galatians six one through five. Okay, and uh, and following that mindset there, Galatians 6, 1 through 5, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and clearly now, let's be clear about this, Luke, because this is an important point. We're talking about if a, per a person be weak in the faith or overtaken in a fault, what are we talking about here? Clearly we're talking about sin. We're not, I mean, because that's the only thing they can be referring to. They're not talking about some small, non in non important issue, it's clearly an issue. You're overtaken in a fault. You you have a problem. There's something you're wrestling with. Um, it's something you're not happy with, but it's part of you, and you're dealing with this. So it's clearly sin they're talking about. So continuing, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Ah, that's a good one for the Lordship Salvationists out there. Thank you. That's a, a, a one I really want to point that out. And we've been talking about that recently. We won't get into detail, but we, you know, we talked about that recently. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, the love which you talked about, Luke. Verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're learning now how to deal with a weak brother or someone that's struggling with, with sin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jackson, you got Matthew? Yeah, I've got Matthew 10, and I also have 18 bookmark. But which verse in 10 did you want me to read again? Uh, verse 17. Okay, verse 17 says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And in 18, which I have bookmarked here, which verses did you want me to read in it? Uh, uh, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Okay, here it is. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him 
be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say, sorry, but shall be loose, not loosed, like loose, L-O-O-S-E. Mm -hmm. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in thy name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay, uh, Matthew 10, 17 first is talking about beware of those who deliver you up to councils. Uh, going to it before a council is never a good thing. <laughs> you're, whenever you're brought before a council, Paul, uh, when he was taken before councils, I mean, they always wanted to you know, punish him or kill him. And so uh, uh, we, we've got to beware of these people who want to bring us before them to, to judge us. Uh, and and uh, well, that's probably the, some, some people that we encounter even today, they don't want to uh, follow the formula that, that Jackson just explained here, the proper formula. They, they want to basically try to uh, tar and feather someone or, or uh, uh, burn them. You know, if, if it was legal today, some people would want to burn us to the stake right now because <laughs> we don't agree with every... every uh, I that's dotted and T that's crossed. Unless you comply with every little nuance, it's not even a necessarily doctrine sometimes, it's, it's nuance to the doctrine, uh, and you don't conform completely, then uh, they want to bring you before the council. And when you bring your butt before the council, the only good, the only thing that comes out of that is, is your death. So these are the people that uh, this is talking about. Uh, uh, what the Bible is saying about how to deal with people who you have, you have problems with and and also the when you should disfellowship and when you should embrace and try to help a brother. It seems like disfellowship is caused by, let's say somebody has absolutely no interest in, and maybe they are saved, but let's say they had no interest in overcoming a sin. Would that be a reason for disfellowshipping then? Or... I think there's a verse where Paul uh, talks about throwing someone out. They they did their best, and he he was so bad they finally had to throw him out and turn him over to the devil. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, you know, the interesting point about that is also. But I think we have to also remember the words of Christ. And here's where we deal with some of the people who've been persecuting some things that we say, persecuting us for things we say. They have the attitude where you cast that person aside, and that's it. You're done. You. You don't deal with them ever again. That's it. But that's not really what God wants us to do. You always allow the door of forgiveness if the person comes back and wants and requests. Remember, you know, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seventy times seven. Well, if that brother does see, you know, you leave him to God. God allows him, like the prodigal, for instance, to go through a series of things that they're going to go through to come to themselves, be broken, and say, "I got to get back to who I was. I got to get back to what I was doing." You always allow the door of forgiveness for that person. And I think that's important. Important to point out. As Luke said, that person in uh, the fifth chapter of First Corinthians was like a major topic in the second letter that Paul wrote to the people in Corinth. And you know what? He he's just. Just broken down later in that letter, he's saying, you know, he even goes to the point whereby he says, are, are you reprobates? No, you're not. Look at who you are. Examine yourselves. Who is in you? Christ is in you. You're holy. You're perfect. In that second chapter, in that second letter, he's, he's, he's crying out to them, guys, stop grieving over this. I know you were hurt. Basically, that's what he's saying. And we can move on from this. Forgive such a person. I think it's in the fourth chapter of uh, Second Corinthians where he says, you know, forgive that person. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, before we finish on this particular topic, and then we close out the sh the show, is uh, how would you summarize what we've learned about disfellowshipping, and also because the Jehovah Witnesses just disfellowship. Um, uh, 
1 over the um, um, the the doctrine they're supposed to you're supposed to just fellowship over the doctrine of Christ but they just fellowship over the doctrine of JWs <laughs> If you if you leave the JW doctrine, they they just fellowship not over the doctrine of Christ, uh, and then they also just fellowship over sin, but we're told not to just fellowship over sin. First, we're supposed to try to help them with it, and then there comes a point where we you finally have to, as Paul said uh, in one example, we turn them over to the devil. Her, his soul is saved, but his flesh give his flesh to the devil. I think is what he said. Oh, actually, it was his spirit saved. Yeah. Um, okay, in other words, the, the, the point he's making is that they're saved, but, but we can't associate with him and let him go live his life of drunkenness and whoring and everything else, and his flesh will be destroyed because sin destroys our, our flesh. Through mm -hmm. you, know, you get disease, you get thrown in prison, you get all kinds of bad things. Yeah. Let, let that all happen to him because, uh, because that's what you get. You're, you're reaping this from your sins. You know, I'm wondering too, this is, check this out. I've been watching Joseph Prince a lot lately. You guys know who he is? Uh, I told you, you know, it, it, I only heard of good things, but I'm really not familiar. But do you, do you guys know who Joseph Prince is? Off, off the top of my head, it doesn't sound familiar. Jack, yes. Yeah. Familiar with him? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar. All right, well, check this out. You, know, you look at uh, Galatians 5.19. But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. My doctrine has changed big time in the past nine months because of watching Joseph Prince talking about the grace, 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 how grace works in us, our non-performance. Self-control, for example, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that we have to work for, Okay. I'm wondering, and he compares this, you know, Galatians 1, 2, 3, and 4, talking about law, 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 grace, law, grace, law, grace, going back to Abraham, you know, and Sarah. Sarah, the mother of grace, and then, of course, Abraham, the father of us all. Well, when we look at going from the end of that fourth chapter, going to that fifth chapter, he's comparing law and the flesh, law and the flesh, and then, boom, he switches and says, he kind of compares and says, okay, grace is with spirit and law is with flesh. It almost appears, almost it seems like the destruction of the flesh might be the destruction of your, I got to work and strive to make God happy, and therefore I'm going to try to keep the law. This Maybe this person in the first Corinthians uh, letter, fifth chapter, was trying to work so hard to the point whereby he, had that fornication with his mother or father's wife, neck in it, whatever you know, what they're reading there. But it's like uh, maybe he wants to destroy his, his, bring him to his end of the law. You can't do this on your own. So we're going to destroy that flesh and thinking of you and let you rest in the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, you're saying, uh, uh, implying then that this person uh, might have been a legalist and trying to follow the law but failing. And he wouldn't listen to grace, and therefore cast out. Yeah, him. I'm one. Look, I'm wondering. And Paul uses this, this phrase, "destruction of the flesh," for other people too. I think Demas was yeah, a person. Uh, he, he's I've never uh, looked at it in that light. But my first thought is that I mean, it's conceivable to me that could also be an application. Maybe it's a better application than I thought than I originally thought. Uh, okay, guys, uh, our two hours is up. Uh, now, we can continue talking privately after we end the show. That's always a lot of fun. <clears throat> but as we're ending the show, I'd like everybody to just make any like closing remarks on anything that stands out to you today from what we've been studying about uh, the JWs. <clears throat> and let's start with uh, uh, Brother Jackson. Actually, I would like to s say that I'm unpleasantly uh, surprised at, at um, several churches that I know of that are well within what would probably be called mainstream Christianity to most people's um, standard who have excommunication systems similar to this and everything and um, treat their members this way and that really uh, that stands out to me and I'm very unhappy with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, 
some of them uh, are they're very very quick to do that but I think what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be very slow to do it <laughs> instead okay brother Eric yeah, and actually your comment there leads right into my comment, and that's kind of where I was going to go with this. I think people who tend to put a great focus on rules of excommunicating people or rules of why we want to push you out, those groups tend to really focus on that, and that tends to be their drive more than I, what I was talking about, which is the drive to win your brother back. I mean, your purpose is, is patience, love, uh, showing that grace that's been given to you to your brothers and your sisters. Um, opportunity for, to forgiveness. Uh, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seventy times seven. That's meant a lot to me in my life recently and it's really changed my perspective on how willing I how, my, how willing I was to point out something maybe somebody else needed to correct. Um, it's really more about, and I've learned so much about it, it's, it's more about not being that other son in the prodigal son story. Don't be the son who uh, has no joy in the return of the brother? You know, um, you want them to come back. Your 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 focus should not be how do I get these people out or when should be the time I get them out. Your focus should be winning your brothers and sisters, not getting them out. Thank you. Uh, let me also back up. In hindsight, I I forgot to do this for Jackson. Good point, brother Jackson. Okay. And finally, uh, Brother Jason. Yeah, one of the big problems that I've had with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses, folks. This is across the board. We're talking about, you know, Lutherans, Catholics, I mean, Evangelicals, Baptists, and kind of, a lot of Pentecostals. It's, it's this works mentality, okay? Good example of this is how they made their own New Living Translation, um, that if thou shalt confess Jesus as Lord, there's two major problems here. One, they have a problem with confessing that Jesus is the Lord, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Without, it's, it's impossible to confess Jesus is the Lord without the Holy Ghost. Okay? No problem there. But the bigger thing is, if thou shalt confess that Jesus is the Lord and exercise his or her belief that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. They add these words, exercise your belief in... Well, yeah, look, we, we all know that... <laughs> we see many people out there who are not exercising their belief that God raised them from the dead, but they literally add that in there. And the whole point here, it's all about a works mentality, a works mentality. And it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses, it's all over the place. Exercise your belief in that? That hurts, you know. But, uh, oh yeah, wow, I, I'm not going to the mic here for a second. You may have been seeing me, obviously, we're on live here, and this could be out there. So, um, you may have been seeing me nod my head. I'm in Cleveland, I've been following my calves getting beat up again by the Miami Heat, so I've been nodding my head. Look at the score. I think we're in the fourth quarter, not a few minutes left. You know what you just did? You're spoiling it from recording it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, let me let me start off by saying I'm, I'm happy that, uh, Jason, you were able to work out the technology and, uh, and um, able to join us, and I, I hope you're able to join us more in the future. Um, anybody on the panel is, has been scrutinized at least to the extent that I may not know a lot about about you when you join. I hope to learn a lot more about everybody, but uh, at least I know that we we believe in these core beliefs and that we are going to be show grace to each other. This is the point that I think Eric made that is so so important that uh, God is gracious to us that when we put our faith in the Savior, we get eternal life. Uh, and I'm very thankful that God is gracious. But God wants us to be gracious to each other. And uh, I, I'm seeing, as I said, I just made this video, most Christians make me sick. <laughs> I, I hate to have to keep on this theme, but I'm not seeing a lot of grace from Christians towards other Christians. Instead, I'm seeing intolerance and... Uh, um, even hatefulness. So uh, I think that we all need to to uh, be gracious to each other, tolerant of each other, listening to each other, hearing each other out. And guess what? You might learn something from your brother if you're willing to listen to him and show him some grace and tolerance. I know I'm learning a lot as we do these hangouts. Uh, 
some people when we started thought that I was doing this as a like uh, I'm teaching a Bible study, but it's not that at all. It's I'm here learning uh, with you, and uh, so I've learned a lot. And uh, hopefully anybody watching the video will learn too. But the most important thing we want you to learn is how to receive this gift of eternal life. And that's real simple. Uh, Jesus said, uh, my, my burden is light, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We want you to get yoked to Jesus. And you do this by putting your faith completely in him. And he embraces you, and he'll never let go. And, and you're yoked to Jesus, and that's all that's required. Put your complete faith and trust in Jesus for your salvation. Put your life, your eternal life, in his hands and trust him to get you into heaven. He'll do it. It's not up to, to you to, to work your way there. Understand that put your faith in him, and he's faithful. He'll give you eternal life. And he's able to do it because he's God. Uh, he says he came down from heaven. Uh, he became a man. He says he had to become a man so he could give his life as a ransom for us. And that's what he did. He died on the cross. He paid for our sins. Now there's no barrier between man and God so man can have a relationship with God. And we do this through Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him. And then he, when you do put your faith in him, you're born again. You become a new creature. You're a child of God. And this is an eternal relationship that can never be lost. So... Uh, we're not asking to join a religion or, or become religious or follow religious rules. We're asking you to trust God, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. If you do that, make a comment, please, and uh, we'd love to hear about it and celebrate. So uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.